Hi guys, Andrew here. I'm talking about a new book today. This one is called The Sorceress. It's the third in the series of the immortal Nicholas Flamel. The Secrets of the Immortal Nicholas Flamel. If we want to get that. So yeah, since this is the third in the series, instead of talking about this book specifically, I will talk about the series as a whole. What the basic plotline is and what my thoughts are on it. The nice thing about this series, we're doing it this way, is that the plot is very continuous. It is one very long story and broken up into six parts. So each book c starts where the last book finished, which is really nice. It makes it easier, especially with this. It's more like talking about a book that I've read half of. So the basic plot line follows uh, two twins. One is Sophie and Josh Newman. And they have just turned 15 and are living with their aunt in San Francisco while their parents are off at an archaeological dig. They have both gotten summer jobs. Um, Sophie works at a coffee shop and that and it is directly across from the bookstore her brother works, Josh. Uh, Josh works for uh, the Flemings, Nick and um, Pern, basically. Nick and Pern. And one day this big long black limo shows up and a gentleman comes out by the name of John D surrounded by men of odd shape which turn out to be golems and they are and John D has been after Nick Flem Fleming or as we will find out Nicholas Flamel for hundreds of years to get his hands on the book of Abraham the mage also known as the codex and this is basically your magic holy grail. It has every spell, every incantation. It was written by the greatest mage of all time, and it is part of the reason that it is the reason that Nicholas Fumel and his wife Purnell are immortal as they drink an elixir that they make from said book. And in this universe it makes them unique because they are one of the only immortals that are immortal under their own power. Most immortals in this storyline are immortal as a result of um, basically God intervention, and the, and I'll get a little bit more into that as we go on. But um, so John D shows up trying to get the book. He attacks, knocks Purnell out, and c captures her, and basically Flamel drops the book and it lands right at Josh's feet, who grabs it. John grabs it, they tuggle over it, John grabs the book, takes off, and leaves base <laughs> and leaves a fireball to kill Nicholas and the boy. They both manage to survive, and it turns out that Josh is still holding on to two pages of the book, which is enough to prevent John D from being able to complete the plans of his Dark Overlords, which is do the final summoning spell which will allow the dark elder gods to return to earth um so and and I, and but as a result of not having the book uh nicholas and his wife are on an automatic time limit because they have to take the elixir every month to maintain immortality and if they don't they they're they, they slowly die. And, of course, having only two pieces of the book is not enough to do it, and the book co spell constantly changes, so they need the book to keep the spell going. In other words, this is a, a reason to have a time limit on how long this character will last. So, um, Nicholas ends up enlisting Josh and Sophie to help him escape, and he believes that they are all in danger, though he doesn't specifically say why. So he takes them to go get someone to help them out, and the person that they get to help him is named Sketchy. She is a powerful next generation elder. So she's also known as the Maiden and the Shadow. She is a warrior vampire who has basically been in every big battle and has trained some of the greatest warriors of all time. Um, they find her and then again are forced to one as John e keeps sending different people out to get them. 
And this is basically what the series is for the most part. It's a very long chase sequence. It's the, okay, we're safe. Oh no, they found us. We fight, and then we run again. Oh no, okay, we're safe. Oh no, we have to fight, and we run, and we go again. So, yeah, if, if you're not into stories that are very action-packed and very this kind of driven, this might not be for you, but, again, it's just a matter of thing. So, we find out from Nicholas that he believes that uh, Joss and Sophie are... Tw that basically, there is a legend. Of course there is. In this kind of story, there's always a legend. But there's a, le a, sto a legend about two twins... And it's one of those very vague, very just basically, they will have us ores of gold and silver, which Joss and Sophie have, and that they will, um, <clears throat> that once they learn all of the, the elemental magics, they will either unite the world and save it or destroy it. It's, and so it's that really fun, <clears throat> will they or won't they, that we've seen before, and we'll probably see for the rest of our existence. So... Um, that's one of the things that's kind of interesting about this, is the way that magic works, is it's you, you use your own aura to manipulate magic and to use it. So each person's aura has a specific scent that correlates to their aura and how they work, and it's kind of interesting, kind of fascinating. Um, so, uh, along with Satchel, mm, Nicholas, Sophie, and Josh all go and hide in one of the Shadow Realms uh, with the tree Yajusil, which is the World Tree. Of course, John D. finds them, and with the help of other next generation immortals, he attacks the tree. And we find out that he has one of the four legendary swords of power. Basically, these swords are older than known any, no, they're as old as known. And his sword is specifically Excalibur. Which has the power of ice. Okay. So, they, the reason that Nicholas and the twins and everyone went to Yadrasil was to awaken Sophie's magical abilities. Because, it's like, otherwise it would take decades to train them. So it's easier to just awaken them. But there are side effects and it could kill her. Type of thing. So they awaken her and she passes out and they escape. But then she awakens and she's, it's basically having all of your senses turned up to 100%. So it, it's blinding her and to teach her how to control this and, how to, and also to teach her the first of the elemental palace, they go to a woman known as the Witch of Endor, also known as the M Mistress of Air. She is one of the very older generation immortals. And she's going to pass her knowledge, literally, into Sophie to train her to magic. Meanwhile, her brother, who has not been awakened, is sitting outside by himself, and John D. shows up, and he's like, he's like, you know, you shouldn't trust Nicholas. He's not telling you the truth, he only cares about this and himself and protecting his wife, he's not trying to save the world, he's just blah de blah de blah and Josh sort of believes him but ends up choosing his sister and they escape into Paris which is the start of the next book and basically the same sort of things happen in Paris and Sophie learns a new power, and then they go in, and then Josh gets awakened, and then the third book, which I just read, starts in London. And so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's a very formulaic story, for the most part, but it's, it does have some strengths, it does have some things that work well for it. One of the things I didn't really talk about is, um, Purnell, his wife, Nicholas's wife, um, escapes from John D., only to find out that she is trapped on Alcatraz Island with no boats and unfortunately no way off the island because the water is protected by mystical creatures 
So majority of this third book is her trying to escape Alcatraz. The second book was her trying to escape her prison cell and then finding out she's on Alcatraz. So, yeah. Um, so some of the strengths of this book. One of the really things I really like is the fact that every single one of these mystical characters, everyone that help they meet along the way who's a magical being, is all based on actual myths and stories and have real world history, which is really interesting. It's really kind of cool. Like, there was a, re there really was a Nicholas from Mal and Pernell. They did exist. They actually still have their house in Paris, which they visit in the second book. Um, there is, there was a real John D, and he was a magician for the queen, for one of the queens of England. Uh, there, there is a list legend of sketchy. There's also, but we also meet a bunch of characters that you will not recognize. That's one of the things I like is there's so many mythological characters I've never heard of in this series, but there's a lot that you've actually heard of. And like, they meet Joan of Arc at a certain point. They meet William Shakespeare at a certain point. You know, there are names that they meet the god Mars. Which is, I find, super interesting that they chose to go with his um, Roman name instead of calling him Ares, which is his Greek name. I thought that was a different twist, because everyone else would have probably gone with, oh, we'll call him Ares and we'll tie him into an even deeper mythology. So, there are elements of it that are really interesting. Um, the story is very, e it's an easy read, it's really quick, got a fast pace, so you constantly want to keep going. And it's got a, but it's also got enough variety that it's kind of interesting because each chapter is from a different person's perspective. So you see from John D's perspective, you see from Nicholas Flamel's perspective, you see from his wife's perspective, and it's so you get to understand the villains and the heroes and different people. And the, like the fighting is good, the action scenes are interesting, the use the use of magic and the idea of magic is pretty interesting, although seems it's it's a it's a little too vague the type of thing it's the it's like there aren't really spells but there are a little confusing um there are a couple things that i have flaws with this series one of my big flaws with this series is uh, not some I honestly, it's like, not, it's not so much like the twins are the problem. I specifically have a problem with Josh, but I also have a problem with Sophie. I have a problem with the fact that they, they don't seem to accept their fate very easily. And in reality, it's like the whole story, the, even up to the Sorcerer's book, is, takes place over like a course of four days. So three books take place over like a couple days. So, them being like, because one of the big problems I have is they're constantly like, when do we get to go home? When is this over? When can we go back to being normal? And in reality, like, thinking that after four days, yeah, okay, that's fine. After having read three, four hundred page books, I'm a little sick of having the main characters be like, when can we go home? I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, and the worst is Josh. Josh is the biggest problem with this because he's not so much screaming about going home, but he is constantly, constantly questioning Nicholas and his motives and what he's doing and why he's doing it and thinking that he's a bad person, all because John D, a person who destroyed an entire underworld and has, kill has sent thousands of monsters to kill them with no, d and, you know, done all these horrible things just to capture them said that Nicholas should not be trusted. It's that thing of going, um, I understand that, that Nicholas is a little bit of a mystery. It is called the secrets of the immortal Nicholas Kamel. He is a little bit held back and doesn't tell you guys everything, which is the annoying, I will admit, and I can understand the frustration at that, but the fact that they are still second-guessing him in this third book and in the third book, it's all about, we, you guys are not the first twins. And the, we find that out, and that there have been hundreds of, tw there may have been hundreds or thousands of twins before them. 
that Nicholas has tried to awaken and teach power, and they've all had... Some, some have gone back to normal lives, some have had horrible existences, some have died. And that leads to this hundred... leads to way too many things of going, I, how did... Did you know that we could die if we did this thing? I'm like, yes. You were told that in the first book. You were all told this is a dangerous thing. Dangerous usually implies the threat of death. <laughs> and yeah, see, that annoys the crap out of me. And it, it, and it, the, the one nice thing is, at least with this third book, for half of the book, that is not an issue. Halfway through the book, once, after a certain point, it's no longer about questioning him. It's about unwakening their powers and getting and moving forward and trying to survive. Which is what the series should be, for the most part. Um, that is probably the that is the real main drag down. Um, the other real dr thing is that there's not. Certain things are not fully explained. You don't understand how certain characters exist or how they work together. So it's like, and again, this is just mostly because it's the way the immortals act towards the human. Is just they they all have their own history, their own deep, elaborate back history, and they don't necessarily explain it to the main characters. So it gets a little much. But it, I do like it. It's an interesting story arc. I do like the fact that the idea that um, there is a Scalper is an actual thing and it is a big, powerful weapon, but it also has equals. Uh, Nick, uh, Nicholas, in the second book, goes and collects a sword that he had hidden many years ago called Clarent, which had the power of fire. And it's also known as the Cursed Blade, which is kind of interesting. And they play upon the idea that it'll uh, corrupt the soul and it'll make them bad people, but it's, just, it's... I always hate that idea and when it comes to power, the idea that there's power that's evil, I'm like... It's like, it's the same as money. I'm like, money isn't evil, it's just ha how you allow it to affect you. Type of thing. So, like, I always dislike the idea that th this power is pure evil, it can never be used for good. It's like, Yes, it can, if there's the person is strong enough to not give in to said power or to use it for the right reasons. But that's a result of a different book that just annoyed me to death about that. Um, I do really like the fact that every character has a history. I wish that you could learn more about them, because there's some where it's like they just kind of brush over it and you're like, Oh, okay, yeah. Mm. So now, so basically, this is almost like a half review, just because it's like half of the series. But overall, I'd say the series is pretty good. It's very well paced. It's a little annoying. It has its moments, but for the most part, it's a fun, action-packed series. The characters are good. The action's good. Stories are easy to get into. So. Overall, I would give this one, I just barely would give it a 4 out of 5. It's, this last book it almost dragged it down to a 3, but after that halfway point, it got better. So, it's a pretty decent series, and I'm, you know, I'm happy that it, it it's, that I got to read it, and I'm looking forward to reading more of said series. Um, I will be doing another one of these very soon. I just read another series that I will talk a little bit about. Uh, another book in the series, and I will do something like this. I will probably end up doing a much longer video for that one, so I may break it up in parts. We will find out. Otherwise, happy reading, and I'll see y'all soon.